Path of Night is an actual play Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. We're all friends, we're here to have fun, but our story can include graphic violence, drug use, sexual content, and other mature themes. Content warnings can be found in the show notes. We've talked at our table about safety, comfort, and consent, both as players and storytellers. We know what to expect. We're all excited to be here, and we want you to feel the same. So listener discretion is advised. Now, let's walk the path of night. Last time on Path of Night. Johnny hid Eden with the hunters. Wynne woke the staked Ira. Ira woke Britta and Miles from their torpor. In exchange, he was released back to his clan. Miles was informed that Jessica Lucinda was looking for him. Miles was then conclaved. He and his quarry were judged by the Camarilla for their crimes against the society. In the end, Lucinda punished them by making Wynne an Archon binding Wynne into unwilling service. The quarter is rounded up. Each of you are brought outside. There, there are eight black SUVs that are gathered up. Johnny, with your experience with all manner of cars, getaway vehicles, etc., etc., you know that these vehicles are up-armored, bulletproof glass, the works. You are, as a coterie, approached by the trio of Josians who are present for the unusually quick and quiet conclave that Prince Davenport endured. The three are very quick to introduce themselves. Leading the trio is a very young man. He doesn't even look old enough to drink and is all smiles and charm. He's in his uniform and he introduces himself as Archon Glenn. He insists he doesn't really do the last name thing and he's going to be kind of your guide to uh, Hartford and states that he's got two of his best friends along for the ride who will be watching your backs. The other two do not speak to you at all. The first of which is Archon Travis, who is an older looking woman. She looks to be in about her mid forties or older than the group of you still like she's very sturdy, definitely has this athletic build, some salt and pepper to her hair. She is of the Bruja clan and just sort of keeps her arms crossed and maintains this kind of stone cold expression. She tends to keep her eye on Neil specifically. But a little bit more relaxed, also a Bruja, is Archon Tully. And Tully keeps this pair of Kukri that are hidden on her like outfit and kind of slung on this like single point sling and at her hip is a kind of very nice, like, MP7 SMG. So just fucking loaded out with weapons. Yeah. She kind of keeps an eye on Johnny, but, like, there's a different vibe to the way the two of them keep eyes on you guys, right? Travis, she looks like if Neil blinks or tries to use obfuscate or anything, she's just going to delim him. Tully's just kind of into Johnny's, like, look, and... <laughs> kind of just appreciates the man's arms. And interestingly enough, you actually recognize her as one of the Bruja that were in attendance uh, <laughs> right on that rooftop. So some of the Bruja were snitches. Maybe. Glenn shakes hands, offers each of you these earbuds that we use for communication, the event, the vehicle that's waylaid and everyone separated. He will indicate to you that there are other Archons who are up ahead, the pathway to Hartford, has been secured as best they can, but there is news of Koldunic sorcerers being in the area and that the Vicos uh, has been spotted in Middletown mere nights ago. Gross. Ugh. 
So there are Sabat who are further up north even than New Haven. Sorry, what is Kuldunik, sorcerer? Oh, go ahead and speaking. Uh, the the Zemisi are um, basically infernalists, and they wield this terrible sorcery from Wallachia, and uh, lots of very Dracula-themed um, magics. They're basically terrible. Kill them on sight. Unfortunately, if it's a golden sorcerer that's very good at what they do, you probably won't see them. G- got it? I think. Just use your uh, black hand training. It'll be fine. And he just kind of like heads over to the SUV. Let's go, guys. I kind of nod at Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, uh, Johnny kind of looks over at Tully and kind of uh, just glances back at Glenn's way. That one's got a fucking loose tongue, doesn't he? Yep. Anyone ever knock it out of his fucking head? Johnny, it's 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 okay. He's tougher than he looks. Uh, you have to be if he's an archon. Britta looks ashamed, and she's holding her hand close to herself, but she's cooperating. Because right now, he looks about as tough as a fucking Jolly Rancher. I'm just going to get in the car at this point. Whatever car they indicate. Let me bring you guys to yeah. uh, one of the more central SUVs. The most of these vehicles, they look exactly the same. When you check plates, all of their plates are the same. Before Wynn is able to get in, Glenn holds up his hand. He's like, ah, actually, her power wishes to speak with you. You'll be riding with her to Hartford. Then she can come and make me. I'm riding with my coterie. His lips thin, and he says, I've got to warn you. When she punishes people, she hits them where it hurts. She kind of looks at Neil and Britta. He gives like a slow nod. Johnny gives Wynn a reassuring nod. You might want to do as her power says. I got things that I control here. I'll keep an eye out. That's not what I'm worried about. My free will is about to come become a luxury I can't afford anymore. Glenn kind of gives you this look. It's already gone. No, I could make this a problem. I'm debating how worth it it is. He raises his watch up to his mouth. Your power, uh, Wynn Cabot wishes to speak with you. After a few moments, Lucinda is seen coming outside. She is accompanied by a pair of archons you had not seen inside with her earlier. And she starts heading towards you. Where's Xavier in all this? Is he still deep inside or is he at the door? He is inside. Okay. She walks past you, does not say anything. When she arrives to the SUV, she opens the door, her SUV, which is a few cars down. She gestures to the back seat. What is your permanent willpower score? Seven. With over 10 successes. Mm Mm-hmm. You find your free will suppressed utterly, and without any words, you obey. And you go over to the other SUV, and your quartery sees you disappear into the back seat. You scoot in, and she sits in the back seat with you and shuts the door. The two uh, Archons that were walking with her. One of them climbs climbs into the driver's seat. The other one climbs into the passenger seat. As everyone gets into their assorted SUVs, they start pulling out. One takes a right out of the parking lot. Another one takes a left. About 40 seconds pass. One takes a right out of the parking lot. Another one takes a left out of the parking lot. And this process continues until all SUVs are out. There's a moment where you think you might actually be able to spot some of the other SUVs that are just like yours, but over the course of a minute or two, they're scattered all over New Haven and are headed off in their respective directions. Seeing the writing on the wall, he, Miles got into the car, was instructed, sat right behind the uh, the driver's seat and waited for this little caravan to get going. 
Britta kind of looks quickly between the other members of her coterie and makes a choice as soon as she sees where Miles sits to slip in from the other side and place herself at a triangle between them, probably technically next to Miles, but so that she can see Neil, not in that exact middle seat. Neil, ever since the confessions, has not said a word, not made a noise, has not attempted to obfuscate, but for all intents and purposes is trying to shrink into like a pocket of reality where no one's paying attention to him. No one looks at him. He's not looking at anyone. Extremely pliable. And when everyone starts getting into the SUV, just gets in, slinks into the back in the bench seat, like away from everyone. And then actually, instead of sitting in the middle, even where you can see everybody scoots over and is sitting behind Miles so that he can like see where Britta is, see where Johnny is, but cannot actually look at Miles. Johnny um, lingers a long while watching the rest of the caravan load up. Specifically, he watches Wynn go off with Lucinde before kind of realizes that he's just standing outside while everyone's loaded into the uh, SUV. Looks back, kind of assesses his options, and uh, loads up into the uh, uh, shotgun. With Charlie at the wheel, the SUV peels out, and you hit the road. At first, it's kind of a quiet drive. No music is played, and the group of you are left with your thoughts. The silence is broken by a Zippo clacking as Johnny lights up a Morley. You don't mind if I smoke this in here, do you? He says blowing a huge cloud of smoke in, in Tully's direction. Not a lot of reasons to blow smoke at someone. Fair enough. Everyone in the car can probably tell, even though Britta wants to be subtle about it, that she's checking in emotionally, trying to take temperatures, trying to read people. Neil is pretty clearly, like... That level so far beyond a panic attack that you're functionally catatonic. You know, he's not actually completely out of it. You can see his eyes darting around, like, marking where they are. It's half hour, 45 minutes, depending on traffic, to get to, you know, the Hartford area. And for the first, you know, for that first 10 minutes of the ride, he's just constantly, like, in a feverish state looking around. But has ascended truly to a level, like, beyond panic. Miles is sitting there quietly. Do we get to keep our weapons? Yes, you do. All right. So he's holding, essentially, he's holding the sword upright between his feet, kind of looking out the window and just wondering what is going to be happening next. So, Tully, where are we headed? Prince Pendragon is hosting the uh, War Council. His army is gathered up. They are ready to make the move towards uh, New York. But we need to make sure defenses for the region are organized properly. So you will be sitting at the table and there are some choices that you'll be needing to make. At the mention of the fact that we're going to Pendragon's Manor, Neil's eyes focus a little bit and flick over directly at Britta. For the moment, Britta is more focused on Miles. There's the mention of the War Council plans that need to be made, and Neil sees Britta trying to give Miles a flicker of... It's meant to be an encouraging smile, but of course she's not sure of it. Kind of turning her body to indicate that she'd be receptive to conversation. But she sees his body positioning, and she's not ready to push. Miles can feel it, so he lets it go. I don't know what is going to be asked here yet. It seems like there have been plans made without me being in on them to some degree, so I'm going to find out, like the rest of you, what we're going to be asked to do. Do you think some of the plans that we got over... We might be able to adapt them for this? I don't know. Seems like most of our plans were just a, a bait and switch for Pendragon to declare his open season on New York. We'll do what we can. I still don't like the idea of sacrificing any particular city, but we'll see what 
information is in front of us. Britta's eyes flick over to Neil. Like, she wants to ask him a question. And she bites down on her words. She isn't quite willing to call attention to him just yet. Almost like he can't quite help himself. When Britta looks over, he just says, uh, maybe, maybe if we're going to be there, we can get your jacket back. Like, he can't quite focus on the larger stuff, and he definitely can't focus on Miles, but his he's just focusing in on one little potential silver lining he might be able to control in some way. Britta, how exactly did you leave on terms with Pendragon last time you saw him? Britta's brain has to reconfigure that question. Uh, the separation between the tone of this moment and whatever memory that her mind goes back to is stark. Um, I'd say the rave made things a lot better. We, um... Her eyes flick not just to Tully, but to Johnny, to Neil. Not so much Miles. She almost kind of shrinks more in Miles' direction. Like, she feels that's uh, the person covering her back in this. It is apparent that you do have sight line to both Neil and Miles and mm -hmm. their eyes. But the position Johnny's in and the mm -hmm. way he's sitting, it is impossible to see the expression on his face. Oh, None very of, much and, so. and because, and, and something might be weird is, is normally when you're in the back seat, Johnny's in the driver's seat and you can usually mm -hmm. see his eyes in the mirror. And it's kind of uncomfortable seeing him in the passenger seat here yep. where he is fucking, it is unreadable to see what's on his face. All you can see is just kind of the, 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 you know, he, yellowish smoke kind of rising up from the uh, from the cigarette. Um, Prince Pendragon and I talked and it seemed to go well, so I think that's better. Um, you don't have to really go into anything about what the two of you have going on, but is there anything that we should be concerned about with how he's going to act or treat or anything that we can do to help you with that? Britta weighs her options, looking around at the car, but she hears Johnny's question in seriousness, and there's some unwillingness to speak uh, that she just has to swallow down, because she's not willing to not say this, even if there's some strange archon in the car. Um, we... We kind of more than talked, and that that's um that's not something I I want you guys to be worried about because that's your business. I just that's something he's been respectful about, and I don't. I know you guys are protective, and I appreciate that. I I I know why. It's just um. Despite everything, despite the strangeness of everything that we go through, the all of the possible horrors and everything that isn't right, everything that we need to navigate, I feel I can trust him in that way. I, I get if you think that's stupid, but... Johnny turns back so you can see his eyes. I don't think it's stupid at all. If you're... Confident, he's being respectful, and you like that, and you don't need any backup. You're good, kid. I just want to make sure you get a chance to let us know if if there's anything we can do to give you backup. There, he will spend a point of willpower to extend Ironheart to you for the duration of what's going on. There is an odd spread of emotion, like the Ironheart catches her in the middle of it. Right at the beginning of it, there's this burst of guilt and self-consciousness that probably due to this being the first time she's talking about it. And there is all of the awkwardness of 
a daughter talking to her dad about sex. <laughs> It's not that simple, of course. There's a lot of conflict. Uh, Britta is feeling almost ready to be judged, right? There's there, there's an understanding of the weight of her admissions and the complexity of the situation that she is admitting to and the man she's admitting to it with. But as you imbue her with Ironheart and you demonstrate your acceptance and your trust, that bravery bolsters her. And all those feelings remain. They just convolute into gratitude and uh, relief. And Britta kind of sags and lets out a wavering but true smile. I... I... Thanks, Johnny. Of course, kid. I know that makes some... Neil, I still appreciate you coming for me. It made me feel safer when I was... He's gonna separate us again. All of us. Well, maybe not all of us. He's gonna separate you from all of us. I... need you, if this is what you want, to tell me specifically that you don't want anyone to come for you. If that's what you want. I need you to tell me uh, explicitly, specifically, that you, you don't need us, want us to, to, to come for you or to be there because he's going to get you alone again. I really, I need you to know that I appreciate you protecting me and I don't want to ignore the words of warning. I, I don't mean to push anything that anyone's done for me in the situation aside. It, like I said, it, it could be foolish, but mom. Well, I feel something, and I want to explore that feeling. I really do. I, I, I'm okay with being alone with him. And I am... Um, I don't want you to come for me, and I, I am... Uh, there's things I want to feel before all this goes down. Y you know? The look on Neil's face, he very clearly does not know but doesn't say anything to, like, countermand her. It makes me feel, um, I hope you're not mad at me, especially with you trying to help me and Elsa trying to help me and... Elsa's final request was for me to get you away from him, but I... Sometimes we have to... To trust that the, each of us knows sometimes what's best for the other. So I, if that's what you want. That's 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 fine. It's not like we could do anything about it in his own house, anyways. Try to get your jacket back, though. I think I can get my jacket back, Neil. And Britta's very clearly saying that, like, to try to give Neil an anchor. The Malkavian's very like he's upset. Things are not going wrong, and he seems very clearly focused on like. Like, material anchors to an out-of-control world. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but he protected me from Dark Selena. I feel safe with him. So, please know it's okay. I'll let you know if I ever don't feel like that, okay? Neil looks like he's going to say something else, and then leans forward and looks at the Archon driving the car doesn't say anything, and sort of sits back in his seat and starts looking out the window. By the way, speaking of Dark Selena, if she ever comes and takes me away, you absolutely have my, my permission to come for my ass. I had already made that decision, yeah. I don't think it's a good idea, but I'd appreciate it. It's Yeah, I'd, I'd already... <laughs> Britta might not have otherwise been able to laugh at the joke, but you can almost hear the echo of your own iron heart and the giggle that manages to come out. Miles smiles a little bit at that. Looking out the window, but he's clearly just not wanting to talk about all of the things that just happened. And from all the way back through the beginning of the night until now. And he's just waiting to see which hammer is going to drop next. It can... He knew it was coming sooner or later. He's been doing what he could to keep it off, but here we are. 
Johnny um, stubs out his Morley into the little ashtray in the center console, pops another cigarette into his mouth, and turns to Tully. You smoke? She shakes her head. Nope, not anymore. Fair enough. Well, if you change your mind, and he, he puts the uh, cigarettes down on the center console just in case she wants one. Like five minutes in, she kind of gives this like shrug, picks up a cigarette, <laughs> and lights it. I just, um, I know exactly from my own perspective what it's like to have to walk into a car like that, and I can't stop thinking about when. When's tough as hell, she'll be all right. Is what happens when you become an archon? The Justicar wanted her for three nights. It says everything I think you need to know. Britta kind of sags into her chair as she realizes what Neil means. Tell you, you work for Lucent? I work for Jan Peterson and the Josians. But yes, what has been implied is true. It's something like this. I think, I think externally, I think throughout the Camarilla, you know, people are going to see this as a, as a promotion or as a, as a reward for win or, or whatever. But I think the people in this car need to remember, need to understand that this was her worst nightmare. That we can't forget that this is, this is exactly everything she didn't, didn't want to happen. And I mean, she only stuck around and this is only happening because she, she, we need to remember she didn't want this. No matter what she says going forward, even if there's not a damn thing we can do about it. I know what Venture do. But she's not going to know. Better she, than all the rest of you. She's not going to remember. Miles. I know that. That's what I'm saying. We need to. There's only so much we can do. We'll see what we can do later. Do you think we'll get to see her tonight? Maybe. I don't think so, but... Is the Justicar attending the war meeting at Prince Pendragon's estate? She's expected to be present, yes. Justicar Lucin will be fighting in New York. I think it's likely we'll probably see her. Whether we can talk to her or not, that's a whole different story. And if we can't talk to her, that answers a whole f bunch of fucking questions about what's going on in that car ride. I know we don't have Wynn here, but I don't know how many more chances we're going to get to talk as a group. It's not the whole coterie, but we're in this together. Nothing we say at Pendragon's is going to be private. From the minute we step on that, on the grounds of his domain, nothing we say is private. I'm not talking about private, I just mean, this is really when things get bad, right? So, we're in it together. Things are going to be tough. I don't think they're going to be that bad. We got much worse on the horizon. I mean... The Sabbat are sending all the shovel heads right at Miles. So, it's coming. Hey, Tully, I remember you, you were at the rave, weren't you? That's correct. I don't think I remember Travis being there, though. Was Travis there? Travis was present, under a different identity. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. So how long have the two of you narcs been assigned to watching us? Ever since the attack that happened at the Nosferatu estate. Gotcha. Have you been in the city? That's correct. So have you... What, 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 you mind sharing what your assignment was? Were you just watching us to keep give us a, a, uh, a hand on things, or...? We were to monitor resistance against the uh, Sabbat and uh, any... Um, Gehenna cult activities taking place within the domain. Britta is listening even 
She's hiding to whatever extent she can hide that that really perks up her attention. But she feels very nervous about that. Neil, you had implied that was a kill box set up by Warwick. What was a kill? Oh, Warwick. Yeah. Um, the it's just all moves in the jihad. Warwick knew that the Sabbat were coming to attack the Gala. He lured Pendragon there so he could die. That's why all the Nosferatu and a lot of the Malkavians escaped. Um, and early. why a lot of the Toreador didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was it was just a uh, using elders using the, the Sabbat attacks to off their rivals. Or attempting to. Maybe that's why Maybe that's why Warwick let me go, because he thought I would die with Prince Pendragon. Knowing the way the elders think, he probably didn't care. Either you died or you didn't, and he could get you later. Not to be cavalier, but trying to think the way that elders think. That I'm. It's also why they left Fester behind, because they didn't care about him. It's not that they were helpless, like, like I was. They just didn't care. So let me get this straight. Tully, you got to the city after that whole mess in, in Rhode Island? That's correct. And you're, so two Bruja Archons got sent to New Haven, didn't make themselves known? didn't help out in any way just to observe how the resistance was going and to look out for Gehenna cults. That's correct. All right. It's an interesting use of resources there. It's not uncommon in terms of compartmentalization. So what that says to me is that you really didn't give a shit about how the resistance was going. You were here just to look out for Gehenna cults. If you're asking if my presence was motivated by some desire to save the day and be emotionally driven towards looking out for my pals, no, that's not why I was there. I was there because I was assigned to be there to complete a task, and I did that. Yeah, no, obviously. I'm just curious as to why the fuck you guys are concerned about Gehenna cults. The quarry that you are with and other kindred within the domain had lost some of the trust of the Camarilla's leaders. We were there to see if any of these rumors were founded. We found that all of them were. It isn't that the Camarilla didn't want to help you. It is that the Camarilla could not trust you. What rumors exactly are we talking about? Neil, right? Yeah. Do you have any copies of the Book of Nod? Yeah. None on me. Do any members of your quarter have a black crescent moon on their palm? Yeah. Yeah. Do Miles Diablo as an elder of his own clan? Johnny looks back at Miles. What about it? Was there talk of Gehenna on the rooftop and in other places? It must be. See, the funny thing, though, is that the that book of Nod, that was uh, material that we recovered from Shaw. Was it destroyed? I think it was It was given over to the people that needed to see it in the domain. It was sent to Archon Peterson's office. Yeah. So, and we, we told you about that. Yes, and then he sent Archons. Right. Archons looking f- for us? Archons monitoring us? the domain. Monitoring the domain. So, we... As a coterie, rooted out people with the Book of Nod, report to the people we're supposed to, and then you watch us from the shadows? Do you believe that you reported everything? At the time, yeah. I think we did. Do you believe you've reported everything since? I believe we have. And I think that maybe we could, we would have been better equipped to deal with this shit if you assisted us and told us maybe some of the things we should have been looking out for, instead of hiding around. Your prince was given his instructions. That was what he needed. I think you freaking Josie and Archons botched this whole thing up and created a situation for Johnny. yourselves. It's 
It's not their fault. Is it not? I think they could have been. Uh, it's they could have be. assisted us, and things would be a lot more in hand. It's got to be exhausting. But we to be a Josian right now. It's got to be exhausting to hide in the shadows. Probably no, Johnny. Josians, correct me if I'm wrong, Archon. Stamp out Ganacolts. And it's got to be an exhausting job right now. They have to be stretched so, so thin right now. It has to be exhausting. It can't be entirely their fault. And you guys didn't report the moon on my hand, so... I don't even understand what that fucking means. It's a Sabbat symbol as far as I know. My sire had a Sabbat moon on his hand. It's... It's... Britta, respectfully, I don't care what the fuck the moon is. But the Camarilla does. Well, then they should have told me more about that. Trust is a commodity that doesn't spend. Well, we learned that after reporting the fucking bo- book of Nod to Jan Peter's zone. Trust and respect is a two-way street. It's been going one way for a long fucking time, and now I think the street's fucking closed. I... I still can't entirely blame the Archons. When the Justicar says don't look up, you can't look up. Um. Speak, speak, speaking of speak, speaking of trust, um. I'm sorry, Miles. I'm sorry you found out. You. It's not what I. The whole point is you were never supposed to find out, and I'm sorry that. That's where you are. I wasn't supposed to find out. No. Defeated the entire purpose. I did it so that you... I don't want to talk about this now. We get through this siege, we'll talk about it. Okay. Okay. Britta slowly leans a bit over, offering a hand out to Miles. He visibly moves away from you. He does not want to be touched. He's not looking at anyone. Britta doesn't seem offended. There's a slight pause as she registers the reaction and moves back into her space. We're still needed. We still have a city to defend. And we'll see what happens next. We'll keep on giving it our best effort. Good. The Archon says. When your quarter is gone, and it is just you, her power, and two of her vassals. She doesn't really look at you, but about ten minutes into the journey, she says... You wish to speak, Archon. Am I able to? Yep. I wanted to ride with my people. Unfortunate. Why wasn't that acceptable? Because we are going to have a conversation. And that couldn't wait? No. She holds her wrist out, and you feel compelled to drink. Can I make a willpower challenge to try and resist? You may not. This is oppressive and demonstrous behavior. But to her, it seems totally routine. That's the worst part. So when dying a little inside, question, if I bite, do I have to be gentle? Or as long as I'm following the order, it doesn't matter how. Your free will is suppressed. You will essentially obey what she is making you do to the best of your ability with best intentions. Her mind screaming at her to use her fangs, fill this woman with venom, rake her claws down her arm. So long as she's dripping, let's be maliciously compliant. But her body will not follow. And Wynne feels the cage around her getting smaller. Your body betrays you. And once she has decided you have enough, you are given new instructions. And she says... Maintain eye contact with me. And 
you do so. And she meets your eyes. This woman is seems very young. And again, you see those when when she an important note is when she removes her red leather glove to have you drink from her wrist, there is a mark upon her hand. And you recognize it to be the mark of the beast. Do you have any um academics? Yes, I do. Okay. I'll, you can may roll intelligence academics. The difficulty is seven. Two successes. With two successes, you are aware that the Mark of the Beast is something of a legend among the Kemria. It is said that uh, long ago, not terribly long ago, but long enough, there was a follower of Set who made all kinds of mayhem when posing as the Ventru Justicar. She had infiltrated the Camarilla so thoroughly that she was posing as a Justicar. When exposed, in response to this, there was a list made of the most wanted kindred on the planet. The most hated enemies of the Camarilla for whom a global blood hunt was not enough. A task force was made to hunt and eliminate these kindred. And those who bear the mark of the beast are their hunters. The Setite was named Kementiri. And when she posed as Justicar, Lucind was her chief archon. And now Lucind bears the mark of the beast first among Alistair's. The organization within the Camarilla who is dedicated to hunting the members of what is known as the Red List. In order to be a member of the Red List, you must be one of the most dangerous vampires that the Camarilla has to offer. Do I know any names from it list, from the list other than... They are largely unknown. Gotcha. They are just these quiet figures that show up to cities to hunt vampires who are thought to be impossible to kill. If they're even vampires... Archon, you have a mission. Prince Davenport has been deemed too unreliable and dangerous for kindred society. On too many occasions he has betrayed our values when it suits him, and therefore he is to be destroyed, executed for his crimes. And due to the Camarilla's needs in terms of morale, it was deemed that this would not be happening before the siege of New Haven. However, we have on good authority that you haven with him, that he trusts you to rest with him, that when he is in his most vulnerable states, you are close by. When this opportunity presents itself after the siege of New Haven, you are to slay Miles Davenport. Fuck you. You try. You try so hard to stand up to her and protect Miles and be who Wynn Cabot is. But as she meets your gaze, your body does not obey you. It exists at this Elder Ventru's whim. Know this, Wynn Cabot. Every evil you thought the Camarilla was capable of, it is and more. You will destroy Miles Davenport, and in doing so, you will redeem the rest of your quarry for its crimes against the Camarilla. They too are found guilty. There is not enough venom inside Wynn. To match how much is in her eyes. For a moment as her power talks and continues to spew this vitriol against the only people that have given Wynne reason to live. Wynne for a moment feels herself back on the night of her embrace, holding her terribly prematurely born baby 
in her hands and powerless to save her daughter. And her body completely at the hands of someone else once again. Everything is ripping apart inside her. Neil was very right. There is there has been no healing. There has just been covering. And all the covers fragment, tear, decay with each word that this woman speaks. And unable to do anything else, she wants so much to just rake her claws across her own throat so that she cannot follow these orders. And all that happens, his tears of blood flood down her face. And she tries very hard to stick up a middle finger, and it's just not happening. And even that small act of rebellion, that death that Wynne had feared for so long that she didn't want to be like the gangrel that exists and have stopped living. And she feels herself becoming this animate husk rended apart and all she's permitted to do is give a small nod you will keep this matter close to your chest and conceal the truth of your intentions from all members of your coterie and beyond it is our secret I will give you Two small gifts as reward for your service, Archon. First, I relieve you of responsibility for what must be done. You have no choice. You have no means of circumventing it. You will obey. You will see this mission to its completion. And when your loved ones mourn the passing of miles you will at least know that you could not stop it. And she rests her hand over yours. And she the com- pulls it away. Nothing happens she when you try. She desperately tries to pull away. And the mission becomes a domine. And then she says, do not discuss this. And your recollection of this conversation becomes enshackled, chained down, and you are given intrinsic knowledge that should you speak of this or try to speak with this, you will be racked with horrific, debilitating pain and will never successfully reveal it. She takes her hand off your hand. She gives a slow nod and the other two Archons who had been quiet up until this point begin to introduce themselves to you. The first one says, Welcome to the team. His tone is grim. And you can kind of, you can kind of tell there's this acknowledgement of your circumstances, though he's been there himself at some point. Can she flip him off? Yes. She does. So you could have stopped it. He kind of like looks over his shoulder like out of your fucking mind kind of look. Black Alistair. Nosferatu. CIA in life. I'll be getting you information on future missions and making sure that you can complete them as safely as possible. No, I am not here to countermand the Justicar. The purpose of this is to maintain the peace. It's mean. It's cruel. But without it, the world turns to chaos. You don't see that now, but you will. Chaos is just rhythm finding peace. 
No, that's not what the masquerade thrives on. And the masquerade has to thrive. The other one. Uh, a younger woman gives you a nod. Red Death. Toriro. She also gets flipped off. And she kind of like looks back at the road and just continues driving. She doesn't really add anything else. I'm not using a stupid code name. We didn't pick these because we were told to. He turns and you sit for a long, quiet ride. I think you're all going to find very quickly you're going to want to see how fast this bike can go backwards. Path of Night is a Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. Britta Ashcroft, the Torridor, was played by Rebecca Segelfess. Johnny Saxon, the Bruja, was played by Garrett Gabby. Miles Savinport, the Venture, was played by Tim Davis. Neil Foster, the Malkavian, was played by Rob Muirhead. Wynn Cabot, the Gangrel, was played by Erica Webb. Your storyteller was Lex Lopez. Recording by Rebecca Segelfess. This episode edited by Rob Muirhead. The music used in this episode was composed for Path of Night by Brian Metolius. Find him online at brianmetolius.com. Path of Night uses the 20th anniversary edition of Vampire the Masquerade with a few limited house rules. Vampire the Masquerade and the World of Darkness are owned by Paradox Interactive. Make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Path of Night. You can help support the show on coffee.com slash Path of Night. Find us on twitter.com slash Path of Night pod, on facebook.com slash Path of Night podcasts, or email us at Path of Night podcasts at gmail.com. See you next time, Kindred. Let's pause there for a quick second. Yep, please. That was very, very well <laughs> very done. Very well done, dude. Absolutely. Yeah. Nope. No, you didn't. It was Tim. More. I was doing yes. She's, she's edited a lot. <laughs> <laughs> She gets two paper towels per game. <laughs> She's got to run through more. <laughs> Just two. Just two. <laughs> rolls, right? She gets two rolls <laughs> per game. This podcast is on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> so much you like this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I was going to offer to get you water or something, ma'am. Do you have a fucking gallon <laughs> I, at your I feet? Could survive I could survive a drought. <laughs> no, I, I could survive a recording. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <dude. clears throat> Hi, Jojo. Yeah, everything's okay, buddy. Was I head? need that doggy. <laughs> I need that doggy. <laughs> Give me that boy. Jojo yeah. just comes over. Hey, is everything good? Oh, it's all good, buddy. Uh, it's just that good angst. <laughs> Those big feelings. Early on, before all that earlier, when yeah. our fucking ceiling friend was making uh -huh. himself very well known, I uh -huh. just got this intense visual of this fucking fisher cat like <laughs> hanging onto the goddamn bumper, <laughs> like, hey, get away from me! Don't get in the car! Don't get in the car! Don't get in the I car! I'm in control! <laughs> I'm here, my real! <laughs> I have friends! I have friends! Oh, I can help! The thing you have like a mouse in your pocket listening to this whole thing, like, uh, you tell us about this one. <laughs> right? I feel like it's me, Hoodie the Mouse. I'm cross genre, bitch. I'm cross and generous. You know when our fans are saying, "I'm in your walls." <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah. Mouse Mercer is in our walls. Stop doing this to Erica. How you doing over there? I'm great. <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking thriving. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, that was all the bad things happening, right? Uh. Yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> not even remotely. <laughs>